G'day, I'm Paul. So dual cab utes are big business in Australia. In fact, last year, the two best selling cars in the entire country were both utes or backies or trucks, whatever you call them. In fact, let me know in the comments section below what you call them, where you're from. This here is the Great Wall Motors Canon. So the Chinese brands are trying to get in on the big business of dual cab utes in Australia. And up until now, they're all I don't know, not that fantastic. This is one that is hoping to buck the trend. It's priced at just under $38,000. This one here is the mid-specification. It competes with things like the Toyota Hilux, the Ford Ranger, the Isuzu D-Max. So today we're going to do a detailed review of this car. I always say car, but a lot of you complain about this dual cab utility. If you do want to skip ahead to other parts of this review, you can use the time codes up on the screen there. Or if you're on YouTube, just scroll down and use the chapters below. And if you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so you can find out every single time we review a new car, truck or ute. Okay, let's talk exterior. You've got five external colours to choose from. All but white is an additional $595. Look how tall this thing is. I don't know, normally these uh, dual cab utes don't come up that high on me. It's got this enormous front end on it. The grille is absolutely huge and it has stacks of chrome. I also thought Mercedes-Benz was going to be challenger for the world's biggest logo on the front, but that is huge. You could sort of take that off and serve up dinner with it. But what do you think about the design? I actually don't think it looks that bad. Yes, all the chrome is a little bit over the top, but it really does stand out in traffic, especially with this blue color. They've offset some of the body colors here with darker tones down the bottom. And then you can see here with the headlights, full LED headlights with LED daytime running lights. And we'll whip around to the side. You get 18 inch alloy wheels, not a bad wheel design. You've got that chromey look on the outside and then the darker tones on the inside. Meaty set of highway terrain tires there as well. Great wall logo off to the side and if we hop up here there's a camera here because this has a 360 degree camera which I think is one of the first in the segment so I'm keen to see how that looks. Side steps along the side there with a little chisel. We've got a plastic outer edge on them so I don't know how good this kind of stuff is going to be for off-roading. Privacy glass, roof rails, you get a sports bar along the back and then come around to the rear. LED tail lights nestled into there. And have a look how tall this is. I'm 185 centimeters tall and this is sitting up. I don't know if it's the ground that's lower where I am or if this is just exceptionally tall, but this is massive. So let's talk dimensions. It's just over 5.4 meters long. To put that into context, a Ford Ranger is about 5.3 meters, just under 5.4. So it's longer than a traditional ute. Now let's have a look at the tray here because some of this stuff I find really interesting. So you've got the logo there, a little bit of chrome there, but have a look at this. So we have hydraulics for releasing this. It means when it comes down, it's softly padded and it's also easy to lift up as well. Now the reason they've done that is because in here there's something hiding. So push of this, cracks this out. You've got a step. That means you're able to climb into the tray and retrieve things. You would have seen this on something like an F-150. I think that's where they got the inspiration from. We'll see if it supports uh, plus sized men. It does. It all feels good, it didn't fall apart. Do that on the way down. Now in terms of the tray dimensions themselves, it's a bit like a square. It's a little over 1.5 meters deep and 1.5 meters wide. And then this mid-spec gets the spray-in tub liner as well. Pop this away. And finally, you have a 3,000 kilogram braked towing capacity with a 300 kilogram downball weight provision. Okay, we are inside the Great Wall Motors Cannon. Let's start with the key. Here it is here. You have lock, unlock, panic, remote start function, and then you have a little bit of silver on the side there, and then the Great Wall logo on the back. It's a proximity sensing key, so you just leave that in your pocket, grab the door handle to unlock the car, and then you have a push button start. Okay, let's talk styling to begin with. Um, look, it all looks fine. Nothing too outrageous here. It looks fairly modern. Uh, you can see the piano black highlights, which I'm not a massive fan of, but they're broken up by all this silver detail. And then it's a pretty cool looking gear stick there as well. All of this is really hard plastic. Uh, this is a little soft here, but the rest of this is pretty scratchy. So it is going to be fairly rough and tumble and strong if, it, uh, if it's going to be used as a work vehicle. So I guess that's better than having something fancy that you're going to wreck. Um, but it doesn't feel quite as premium as some of the more established uh, competitors in this segment. What about your touch points though? So that feels nice. 
and so does that. Now in terms of the touch points, we've tested those with our Gerometer. If you want to see how they compare to other vehicles we've tested before, scroll down and have a look at the link in the description below. Now what about build quality? Does cheap mean cheap? No, look, it all feels okay. I mean, we haven't owned the car for years, but uh, basically the testing we've done so far has been pretty good. So let's see if it stands the test of time. Okay, let's talk infotainment. Nine inch infotainment system. It's a pretty basic infotainment system, but it does the job, I guess. So I'll run you through just a sort of brief overview of how it works and the features that it has. So in terms of radio, you have AM and FM radio, no DAB plus digital radio there. There is no inbuilt navigation, but it does come with both Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Both of those are wired not wireless. I'll show you what Android Auto looks like to start with. There you go. So full screen integration, that looks nice and works well. There is no voice recognition button on the steering wheel. So if you do need to use voice recognition, you've got to manually come into here and then select it yourself. Let's have a look at what Apple CarPlay looks like. There you go. Full screen as well. Whoops. Okay. It's, oh, that's weird. It's like slightly not responsive. Um, it doesn't really notice when you try and swipe. But yeah, full screen integration, and it looks nice and sharp there too. So same story, voice recognition, you come into here, and you have to push and hold to get Siri to respond. Okay, what about safety? So this hasn't been crash tested yet, and I say that because the last generation of this Ute crashed very poorly in crash tests. So it is probably worth just hanging out a little bit longer to see how that performs. But in terms of standard safety equipment, they've actually thrown the feature book at it, which makes me confident that they've fixed the issues of the previous gen models. So you have autonomous emergency braking with pedestrian detection. You have an auto dimming rear vision mirror. You have a lane keeping assistant and a lane departure warning, a blind spot monitor built into this wing mirror, and also adaptive cruise control. Now in terms of reverse view camera, you have front and rear parking sensors and a 360 degree camera. Let's have a look at what that looks like. So you can see there, 360 degree view. You also have the rear view. It's actually quite sharp. So the vision here is great. You can then go full rear view. You've also got the option to go to like a side mirror view as well. So there it is there. You can see the front wheels. And there is another 3D view that sometimes comes up, <laughs> sometimes doesn't. So Igor, if you open your door, it comes up and then close it, it then disappears and won't let us bring that up again. So yeah, look, it's, and then it's got other things like the writing up at the top here that is in English. So yeah, it's, it's a really good implementation, but it just does some really strange things, unfortunately. Righto, let's talk about practicality and we'll start with connectivity. We'll get rid of this first. So you have two USB ports down the front here. One is for smartphone mirroring, one is just for charging. You have a 12 volt outlet, but similar to the Ford Ranger, there is also a USB port up the top here for dash cam installation. So clever integration there. And then on the storage front, we'll start with the phone. You can easily sit it down the front there. There's also a slot here, but it doesn't really fit bigger phones and they sort of fit in the cup holders. In terms of cups themselves, we've got our small coffee cup here. Fits in nice and easily and plenty of clearance there for the lid. I'll try a bottle as well. No dramas there. Nice teeth on the side there to keep everything in check. And then you also have bottle storage inside the door. Over here, center console, nice and deep, but the cool thing is it extends inwards as well. So you can actually store a fair bit in there to give you an idea of the depth. There's a bottle going in, doesn't quite fit. Then you have glove box over here, bottle easily fits in there. And finally, the sunglasses holder, instead of being up here, it's actually located just here above the driver's head. Okay, moving on to comfort. You have single zone automatic climate control. You have seat heating for the driver and front passenger, and then electric seat adjustment for the driver. Seats themselves are actually quite comfortable. They hug you in nicely. Steering wheel feels fairly big, but it sits nicely in the hand, and it has just tilt adjustment, no reach adjustment but in terms of the controls, they're all nice and easy to reach. Okay, before I hop into the back, let's have a look at storage and versatility back here. So one pull of this lever lifts the bottom. You can also hook the seat up so it stays out of the way. A little bit of storage under here that'll keep sensitive items away from prying eyes. And then if I drop this as well, this is where you'll see top tether points, also the jack. Let's have a look at how much room there is. Okay, 
Look at that, that's actually really impressive. I've my seat pretty far back and I've got loads of knee room, heaps of toe room. Headroom is really good as well. There is no center armrest, but you can stick the bottle inside the door if you want to. I saw fixed points on the two outboard seats. I've got air vents back here, map pockets as well, but I love this. You have a 220 volt outlet there for tools, irons, whatever you want to plug into there, and then a USB port as well. So it's actually a pretty impressive space back here. Okay, we're on the road in the GWM Canon L. I just love the name of it, it just sounds like it'll go through fences and stuff. Um, okay, so powering this is a two litre four cylinder turbocharged diesel engine. It makes 120 kilowatts of power and 400 newton metres of torque. Now I know what you're thinking, aren't all the other, or most of the other dual cab utes in this segment now 500 newton metres? Yes, you'd be correct. So this is already starting out with less torque than pretty much all of the competitors, but it is made into an eight speed ZF transmission. So that is a really good gearbox. And the other big advantage it has is that it's a permanent four wheel drive. Most other utes in this segment are two wheel drive, but can be switched to four wheel drive unless you're on a sealed surface. And then in addition to that, this also has rear disc brakes. But how does it perform? Well, while you're moving, it's, it's reasonable. You put the foot down, once it actually starts going, it, it picks up and moves really well, but it's from a standing start that it feels like an absolute slug. So if we get on the throttle from a standing start, you count the delay here from when we actually get anything. So foot's flat, nothing, nothing, everything. So there's a lot of turbocharger lag before it actually kicks on and does anything. So yeah, I think that's going to be one of the big downsides of this engine is just how unresponsive it is down low in the rev band. GWM claims a combined fuel economy of 9.4 litres per 100 k's. Let's see how we're doing. 12.1, so near enough to where it should be. And it's kind of in line with the other competitors in this segment in terms of average economy over these types of roads. What about the drive mode? So you have three to choose from. You've got Eco, Normal, and sport. So I did notice there when I flicked to sport, the throttle became more sensitive. So it does feel a little bit better. It is still a tiny bit laggy, but once it's up in the rev band, it's moving. Let's talk noise. So while the engine is pretty quiet, give it that much it it's uh, even once you get up it it isn't a great deal of sound that comes into the cabin there is a fair bit of road noise and there's a fair bit of wind noise as well it is granted fairly windy today but I can hear a lot coming over those wing mirrors and there's a fair bit of road noise coming in through the tires as well might be able to fix that with a different brand of tires but yeah it is a slightly noisy place to be on a corrugated country road Righto, what's the ride like? You've just bought your new GWM Canon. Is it going to send you mad? Look, it's it's good. It's definitely not class leading, but it's also definitely not the worst we've ever experienced. It's quite busy, especially over country roads like this where you have corrugations and potholes along the road. But for the most part, it's okay. I think it'd settle with a bit of a loader in the rear, but it's nowhere near as firm as that original Hilux tune. So if I catch some of these potholes on the side, kind of just jiggles around a bit. So look, it's okay. I think it's one of the compromises you make when you don't go with a car that's sort of strictly designed and engineered in Australia, like the Ranger or the Hilux, which has had a lot of tuning work locally. But I think for the most part, it's not gonna drive you mad. Okay, let's talk handling. It's a dual cab ute, so no one really cares how it handles, but let's see what it's like. Punch it into this corner. Hey, look, it's not terrible. There isn't a great deal, well, there isn't really any feel through the steering wheel. It is an electrically assisted steering rack, which is good, but you know, the, you can't really feel anything about center. And then when you put it into sport mode, it just becomes artificially heavy. You don't actually get any additional feel. Um, but you're obviously not going to be carving up mountain roads in this. So if you do find yourself through a couple of corners, it's not going to terribly disappoint you. Turning circle on the other hand, 13.1 meters. That is pretty big, so that is going to mean if you find yourself needing to do a U-turn, there's going to be a whole lot of three-point turns happening. Now, what's visibility like? So you've got the 360 camera, which helps with parking, especially when you consider how long this vehicle is, but visibility down the front's fine. I can see most parts of the bonnet. 
You've got big wing mirrors as well, so you can see down the side of the car, you've got the blind spot monitor built into there as well. Visibility out the rear is pretty good. That is a big old window. So you feel confident sitting up this high. It's, um, you know, you can really sort of see around the car when it comes to parking and maneuvering in traffic. There's no dramas. Okay, let's talk off-roading. You will have noticed that it's now raining and no longer sunny. <laughs> Don't ask, the weather is terrible today. Okay, so in terms of off-roading equipment, I mentioned earlier that this is a full-time four-wheel drive, but in addition to that, you have a low-range transmission and a rear differential lock. We also have 27 degrees of approach angle, 25 degrees of departure angle. The approach angle is the angle of the face you can approach before you hit anything, and the departure angle is the same, but in reverse. We also have 192 millimeters of ground clearance, so not a massive amount, and I suspect we're possibly gonna to touch some rocks on the way down up here. Now, if none of that makes any sense to you, you can click up here to watch a video we've shot explaining four-wheel drive controls and how all-wheel drive systems in four-wheel drives work. Okay, so let's get started. I'll probably just leave these controls as they are, just so we can see how it goes, given it is all-wheel drive to begin with. Okay, here we go, the logs are wet at the moment because at our downpour. Let's see how it goes here. Yeah, see, the problem here is it's so touchy. At that 2000 RPM mark, when it comes on boost, it just gives you everything instead of being gentle. Yeah, that's really not good. Um, okay, so that is going to be one of the downsides to this. If you are doing any off-roading, you're probably going to want to stay in low range because it just surges too much when it comes on boost. Okay, let's head down our rocks. Now, I mentioned earlier that ground clearance, it means we're probably going to touch a little on the way down here. Let's see how we go. There's also a hill descent control available to help control your descent speed. There's a little touch there. It actually feels pretty comfortable inside the cabin. It's not really um, swaying around too much. I have decent control through the steering as well. Another touch there. Yeah, 192 millimeters. It's probably not going to be sufficient if you're doing any serious off-roading. You'll want to lift this slightly higher, otherwise you're gonna keep whacking things underneath the car. There we go, not too bad. Okay, so we're gonna do it once more. This time around though, I'm going to go into low range and also lock the rear differential, just so we can see if that surging issue disappears. So I'm gonna put it into neutral. We'll slide it around into 4L. So it says 4L mode switching, there it is there, and it disables stability control. We'll turn on the rear diff lock as well. It comes up with a little icon on the screen there. Okay, we're in low range. So let's give our hill a try again. We'll see if it's any better this time around. Yeah, that feels much better. So right now it's crawling up here really smoothly. Before, when I, when I lean on the throttle, it would just surge us forward and kill those parking sensors. That is much, much better. Okay, there you go. So if you are gonna do any off-roading, despite the fact it has a permanent all-wheel drive system, I would be using low range. Anyway, um, let's put hill descent control on as well. We'll see how that feels behind the wheel. A little clunk there. Okay, so I'll use hill descent control on the lower portion of our track here. It actually feels much better here in low range coming down the hill as well, because the descent speed feels more controlled. Okay, so far so good. And I'll let go of the brake here now, test hill descent control. It's going down pretty slowly, but that's good. Okay, there you go. So, answer to all this is low range, rear diff lock, and you should be able to go anywhere, especially if you're doing light off-roading like we are. So the GWM Cannon. Sorry about all the wind, the weather is absolutely feral today. I'll tell you what, this has taken me by surprise. I wasn't expecting it to be as decent as it is for 37 odd thousand dollars. This is about half the price of something like a Ford Ranger Raptor. So that puts it into context why this is such a good value proposition, especially when you consider all the features that it comes standard with. But there are a couple of caveats here. That engine is probably not gonna be amazing for towing, despite the fact it can tow 3000 kilograms. It just doesn't have enough punch or urge with a trailer on the back. It's also quite peaky as well. It has nothing and then it just gives you everything and that affects it slightly off-road. But if you put those points to the side and you're not really too fussed by brands, it doesn't really put a foot wrong. So my only recommendation is just wait until they do a crash test. The last version of this, the Steed, was absolutely appalling in terms of the way that it crashed. So I wouldn't be buying this until there is a published crash test result out there. But if it is safe and you want an affordable ute, you don't need all of the fancy brand names out there like Hilux, Ranger, D-Max, that type of thing. 
I think you should check this thing out. So let me know in the comments section below, would you ever buy something like this or are you gonna stick with a Hilux no matter what? Let me know what you think in the comments section. And if you've bought one, how has it been so far? I'm really keen to get your feedback. Thank you for watching this. If you did enjoy it, make sure you share it with your mates. And if you haven't done so already, hit like, subscribe and press the bell icon so you can find out every single time we drive one of these new things. But until next time, take it easy.